Good morning. Thank you very much, Russ, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here to be the uh, Adams Lecturer in Otorangology. And today, I'm going to speak to you about the evolution of my facelift techniques. This is something that uh, has uh, taken time to develop, uh, hence the word evolution, and I wanted to share with you because looking back, it's interesting how my methods have changed in response to different uh, different uh, things that's happened uh, in our practice and our understanding of facial aging. The picture you see here is uh, from, it's taken from our office window, actually, uh, in uh, OHSU. The medical center is on a hill overlooking the city, and the our facility infrastructure ran out of space relatively quickly uh, in terms of the hospital, the medical school, the research facilities, the nursing school, the veterans, children's hospital, shriners, and so on. And so the uh, university was uh, allocated a, a plot of land down by the Willamette River, which cuts through the city of Portland, and they built the new medical school down there and the new uh, medical uh, office building called CHH, Center for Health and Healing. But there's no direct way to go travel back and forth from the top of the hill down to the riverfront, which is about a mile, mile and a half away. And there's some surface roads, and on busy, uh, congested times, it can take easily 30 minutes or more to go from door to door from my car, from the parking lot down at CHH up to the hill. And so the administration thought sort of out of the box and decided to build a ski tram, which is what you see here. And that tram can connects the CHH waterfront campus with the hilltop uh, medical center, we call it the mothership, and we think of it basically as our elevator. It takes about three, three and a half minutes, and it's a beautiful scenic ride. So as you can see, down below is our local ski mountain that's Mount Hood that's got snow on it year-round. It's uh, got the glacier of U.S. ski team trains there, and so I invite you, for those of you who may not have visited Oregon, to come and uh, visit Portland and have a chance to ride the uh, ride our elevator. It's, it's the other innovative thing about this is that made it work is that they incorporated this as part of the uh, metropolitan transit system so that if you bought a bus ticket, you can uh, fly into Portland, land at PDX, take the streetcar or the max train to, uh, to the CHH, and your bus ticket will be good for a ride up. Like a ski tram, you pay going up, it's free coming down. Uh, so I invite you to visit us. Speaking of Portland, this is uh, Russell visiting me and with one of our other co-residents, uh, Dr. Jonathan Seitz, at one of our Portland rhinoplasty meetings uh, recently during the cadaver lab dissection. And uh, another picture I came up of three good friends, also uh, fellow Northwestern uh, resident uh, trainees, Russell, of course, Russ Reese, uh, myself, and then Dr. Vito Patella who bridged the year between us. So, so Russell was my senior resident when I was a junior, and Vito and was a year ahead of me. And this is actually, I believe this was taken uh, in, uh, in South America, in uh, Colombia, one, one, one of our meetings in, in Cartagena. That's the bay in the back. Of where there's a hill on top of Cartagena. We hiked up there. There's a fort up there. Um, and so we, we took, a, took the opportunity to grab a snapshot in South America. Speaking of South America, is Scott here? Scott Stephan? No, he's, he's unfortunately not here. He was my fellow. And every year, uh, for the past uh, couple of decades, I've led, led a cleft mission trip to Peru. And you can, can you see Scott right there? And he, uh, the fellow gets to go and uh, do interview of all the patients, and here he is in a, in a candid uh, working mode, uh, and showing the local physicians and nursing staff how he does things, how things are done, and uh, working in the operating room. And it's a great experience, it introduces the fellows to the opportunity to render humanitarian care, but this is much more than just buying a plane ticket and going and operating and then going to Machu Picchu or something. This is, the fellow is intimately involved with the logistics, the uh, the gathering of supplies, they have to get the sutures, they have to help pack and coordinate all sorts of uh, scheduling and so on so that the foundation is laid to allow them to uh, continue this type of work which I know is very robust here at, uh, at Vanderbilt. All right, facelift techniques. As we age, a number of changes occur to our faces and relationships uh, between the vertical thirds change, the uh, Skeletal, structural, uh, 
uh, skin components uh, alter and platysmal laxity and dehiscence can combine to create the different appearances in our aging face at, as time passes. And this is an interesting magazine cover that I came across uh, that showed uh, three generations of the same family. Now, three generations of a family is not that unusual. What made what caught my eye here was the fact that the, the young granddaughter here is looking at us, she's very cute, and looking right at the camera, engaging us, the viewer. What was interesting is the fact that the mother and the grandmother are looking straight off camera in perfect profile view. Usually all the, all the subjects are engaging with the viewer, with, with you, with the person looking at the, at the magazine cover. And you can see that uh, for the mother, that her, her brow is in an excellent position, her eyelids uh, are clear and open, uh, her cheek is uh, well supported and relatively full, her jawline is crisp, and her neck is relatively tight. And uh, you can see the same features on the grandmother, you can see some relaxation of the eyebrow, crow's feet development, uh, some descent of the malar fat pad, a relaxation of the neckline and jowl formation and uh, platysmal uh, relaxation as well. And incidentally, I'm sure you've all heard that the two things that continues to grow in our faces as we age are what? The nose and the ear. And so if you look at the daughter's nose, I mean, the, there's clearly a family resemblance, but you can see it's not that it actually grows, but the nose becomes a little more tonic because the soft tissue relaxes. And so the, there's a pseudo hump that develops and the nose appears to be, the, the rotation is decreased. And then the earlobe, it doesn't, again, it doesn't actually grow, it just, the soft tissue stretches and elongates, so it does enlarge in size. And so these are the components of what we refer to as the aging face syndrome. And of course, the most glaring thing that you can see that caught my eye is the other component. The first, the two things that happen are descent, we talked about that, and deflation. And look at the fullness of the face, and look at the shadows here. The, the aging process really, especially in the temple area, creates, a, creates a indentation, depressions there, and loss of fullness of the uh, malar and submalar regions, not to mention the central facial structures, which we'll talk about. So what we're discussing here, dealing with, is really the aging face syndrome. Here is the uh, artist's rendition of a, a diagram of the aging face changes, and what we're speaking about is really how to reverse that, or correct that, or rejuvenate the face, uh, uh, mainly with the effect of a scalpel. Uh, but then we'll get into all of the techniques uh, in, in great detail, but before I do that, that, that talks about how we do this, I want to touch on something that I think is actually more important than how we do this, and that is, who do we do it to, why do we do it, and, and uh, what are we doing, actually? Not just the how, but the who, what, and why. And that comes about in the aging face consultation, which I feel is a neglected topic that uh, most surgeons, who we, it's fun to talk about how we do things because we're all technicians and we like to, we like to do things, but ultimately the reason why we do think these things is to try to gain patient satisfaction. That's the why. That's the bottom line of why we do any of these things. This patient comes to me, walks through my uh, doors and for a consultation, for an aging face consultation. That's what I see on the intake form. She wants to uh, discuss correction, improving her facial appearance. So right away, you know, I walk into the room and I see the patient, I see her face, and I have some ideas in my mind of what she might benefit from. So just for fun, show of hands, who thinks uh, she is interested in a brow lift? Nobody. Who thinks she might be wanting an upper lid blepharoplasty? Mm -hmm. All right. I thought she might. Uh, <laughs> who thought lower lid blepharoplasty, maybe? Yeah, okay, yeah. I thought so. And a uh, lower face and neck lift? Mm -hmm. Perhaps, yeah. And so, I come in, as you will too, if you do this type, type of work, and you come in, and within a, a snap, or a millisecond, you sort of have a, a gestalt of the patient's face and a concept of what she might be interested in. And then, what I do is I set that all aside. I ask the patient, 
what do you want? What can I do for you? And I greet them and I introduce myself. That's all very important. But the questions are open-ended. What brings you to, to the office today? What the, you know, I don't go, boy, you, you really have some bags there. Can we, can we fix that for you? <laughs> you, you want to be very open-ended open with these questions. And as it turned out, for this lovely young lady, she underwent the procedure. She, it was her lower eyelids. She was really bothered by it. And this was about a year later. But you know what else she was bothered by? A crooked nose. And then you look back and go, of course, I want to go right out there. And so we straightened it out. And she also had a hump on the nose that you can see that she was concerned about. She didn't want a scooped out nose. She just wanted a straightened bridge. And the combination made her quite happy. She was very satisfied. And uh, we got to this point from the pre to the post-op by the discussion <coughs> and kind of me finding out what it is that she was concerning for her and trying to meet her expectations to create patient satisfaction. So you have to recognize that every patient has their unique individual needs and concerns. So try not to jump to conclusions, keep an open mind. I certainly made my fair share mistakes trying to do that coming in and like the patient with a hump thinking that they want the rhinoplasty and they turn out it didn't bother them at all. And so uh, ask open-ended questions and most importantly, listen to the patient. That is really key. And that applies not just to patient plastic surgery, but to all aspects of our practice. Once we've established what it is the patient is seeking, then I put on the MD hat, if you will, and go through the detailed history of, of the medical history, social history, surgical history, and so on. We have patients fill out a pretty standardized form that outlines all the different aspects of things that might be important in general history, general medical history. Uh, vision status is very important because we're operating oftentimes around the eyes, certainly for blepharoplasty, we're working right there. Uh, determine visual acuity, sometimes just asking the patient is sufficient. I keep a little pocket snelling chart, have them look at it 12 inches, you can look for close one eye, close the other, and it's easy to, to have a, an approximate estimation of, of their visual acuity. Document that in the chart uh, anytime you're working around the eyes. History of dry eyes is critical because many patients have dry eyes and they don't even mention it to you. If you do blepharoplasty, particularly upper lip blepharoplasty, we're removing more part of the anterior lamella. You have the potential of decreasing their ability to close their eyes, decreasing the a function of the particularis, and that can certainly exacerbate dryness of the eyes. And if you go on the internet, looking up uh, uh, unhappy patients after plastic surgery, dry eyes, unable to, being unable to close their eyes is a huge, one of the most prominent uh, complaints. And so always uh, get the history of that. If that is, if they do indeed have the history, I always tell the patients that after, after blepharoplasty, the dry, dryness of the eyes may be exacerbated, they'll have to up the frequency, and then over the course of two to three months, that should taper down. Once they've heard that from me, then it's no big deal. It's, they expect that, oh, Dr. Wong told me this is gonna happen, it's fine. But if you don't tell them, and their dryness is worse and, and worse yet, they don't use the increased drops, you can get into the exacerbation and corneal irritation, ulceration, and all sorts of other issues. Of course, you have to ask us uh, history of skin conditions, eczema, psoriasis, uh, rosacea, sun exposure, uh, skin cancer, moles, if they had knows where their reconstruction was and you get a sense of how their scars healed over time. Body weight trend, that is very important in aging face and surgery, lower facial uh, correction because it's been my sort of anecdotal experience that, uh, as I mentioned, there's descent and deflation, and we'll be touching on that in greater detail. But Gaining weight oftentimes causes the face to be fuller, which reverses some of the effects of aging. As I tell many of my patients, uh, chubby people tend to look more youthful because they sh their faces show less signs of deflation. Conversely, patients who may, just about every other patient I see now, feels that they're overweight and they want to lose anywhere from 10 to 50 pounds, I always tell them to reach their target, or at least be within five pounds of their target weight before their face lift. The last thing you want to do is go ahead and tighten things up and then have them drop 20 pounds. Their face will immediately fall and they'll come back and say, Doctor, you didn't do a good job. And so always find out their body weight and the trend. If they're happy with their weight, that's fine. But if they want to lose, have them get close to their target weight before you embark in any, uh, any, any tightening procedure. 
And then nowadays, I'm sure you encounter this here as well, MRSA is, is prevalent, it's everywhere. Uh, I always ask about that. Uh, in uh, aging face surgery, it's important if the patient has had MRSA, then I put them on the appropriate antibiotics. And this is actually more of a concern in rhinoplasty surgery, because as we know, MRSA colonizes right in the nasal vestibules. And so for rhinoplasty patients, a fair share of my clientele for rhinoplasty are healthcare providers. If they are, I automatically assume they're MRSA colonized, even if they test negative. I, I move forward, I proceed as if they are colonized. What I do there is I have them, uh, I have them trim their nose hairs. I get, have them get one of those little nose hair clippers and give their nose hairs a crew cut. I have them do that a week before surgery and then I give them reparison so they apply a TID for a week before and a month after because my nasal incisions is right in where MRSA is. And believe me, you do not want to have a patient have MRSA after an open rhinoplasty because it just melts all cartilage, all grafts. I don't know if you encountered that, but it's it's horrendous. It's really difficult to, to manage. And so I, on the other side, I'm excessively uh, cautious, abundance of caution to try to try to minimize that risk. I ask patients about their previous facial plastic surgical procedures, including the non-scalpel things, the light laser fillers, injectables just to get a sense of where they are. Patients who've had lots and lots of procedures raises the flag, obviously, as it should. Uh, you're wondering if this is a, someone who's uh, addicted to cosmetic surgery and maybe has manifestations of body dysmorphic disorder, and that's a whole different discussion. But that helps us to try to uh, find, select out that segment of the population. Smoking, tobacco, of course, cannabis, is much more popular now than vaping. I don't know what the statutes in Tennessee, it's legal in Oregon. Every every two blocks you have a pot shop. I mean, there's everybody smoking pot. And so you have to ask that. It's, is it not legal here? Oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, it's just down the street. You scroll down, it's, it's more prevalent than liquor stores. It's, it's lots of cannabis, yeah. It's everywhere. Uh, and vaping, of course, that counts as smoking because that like, diminishes oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, and that can uh, compromise the skin flat healing uh, capacity. And the history of recreational drug use, patients would be very forthright and, and <coughs> honest with that. And that's important for us to know because um, if they smoke, I tell them that they have to discontinue smoking, also all forms of smoking and vaping, for four weeks before and four weeks after. If they refuse or if they can't do that, or if I smell tobacco, then I cancel their surgery. I tell them that up front. I give them a refund, it's not like, you know, refund, but, uh, but that's, uh, I, to me, it's not worth taking a risk because if I do proceed with surgery and they have a complication, then it's on me to correct that and, you know, just, I don't want to deal with that. Marital status, what sort of social support mechanism they have, uh, and occupation, again, from the MRSA perspective, and as well as uh, physical exertion, physical activity. It's important. And then friends with facial surgeries, their general overall awareness of uh, facial plastic surgery and specifically recovery required from facelift surgery. And how do they hear about us? And that's a whole topic of discussion unto itself. Marketing and facial plastic surgery, Facebook, Instagram, very popular. Real Self is a consumer driven website where they can ask questions of surgeons and questions respond. But there is no substitute for word of mouth. Word of mouth is still my number one referral source. Happy patient tells five or ten of his or her friends, and that's what happens. Um, for aging face surgery, a word of mouth is much more effective along with Facebook. For rhinoplasty and little fillers, for the younger demographic, Instagram is becoming much more popular. Um, and so for those of you going into facial plastic surgery, you'll become well aware of that uh, relatively quickly as you start practice. Once we've gone through all of that and established that the patient is uh, a candidate, medically speaking, then we go through the physical examination. And this involves actually looking at the patient, feeling the patient, touching the patient's face and the skin tissues. I put gloves on and I always manipulate the areas. And this uh, is more for the residents, of course, because you'll get this question on, on your oral quizzes that you have to go through as part of your certification process evaluate this face. Whenever you get that question in, in the facial plastic section, or in any other section, you have to go through the Fitzpatrick and the Glogau classifications. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's right there. 
The fits factors, you always have to go, this is fits factor one, two, three, four, five, six, and the definition is obviously right there. Oh, very white freckles, never tans, always burns, to black, always tans, no burns, and so on. It's easy to make an assessment. And then the glow gap classification of type one is early wrinkles, type two is wrinkles when they're making facial expressions, type three is some wrinkles at rest, and type four is all wrinkles all the time. And the approximate age groups. And those, most of the patients that come for age and face consultation will be type three or type four. When they come in in type two, certainly type one, they don't really need anything. Type two, maybe we're thinking about Botox or fillers, the you know, prophylactic or preventative uh, aspect. And three and fours are the ones where we're considering more surgical options. Look at the facial structures in general and note symmetry, because patients don't note their facial symmetry preoperatively. But you know what? They sure as heck do postoperatively. Hey, my eyebrows are different, or my cheeks are different, and this or that. And then you just go back and look at their faces beforehand, and sure enough, it's it's different. And uh, so it's important to note that, and note that the behavioral habits, such as sleep position, can really alter their facial structures. They can constantly sleep on one side. They, that can deepen a crease or a fold or pull down an eyebrow. Point that out to the patients. It's easy for me to look at a patient's face and predict which side they sleep on because it always is, uh, is manifest. And the, the corollary to that is I tell, point that out to the patient and tell them that I can't correct that. They say, well, oh, okay, good, now that you mentioned it, can't you get rid of that? I said, no, I can tug it up and say your eyebrow is different. I can pull, pull it up or pull it tighter on one side, but you're going to go back and you're going to sleep eight hours a night and the pillow's going to smoosh it. I can't compete against that the years and years and years of, of making a crease just one intervention. So once they, you explain it to them that way, they, they have a better understanding of that. And so these are, are things, and their facial expressions, some patients like to raise one eyebrow or do, do whatever, and you'll notice that uh, very quickly during the examination and during your uh, verbal interactions with the patient. And those are the things that should be noted as, as well with the deflation, the effects of deflation and descent. And so I inspect all of these anatomic areas. I'm going to list them out, and it looks very lengthy, but in reality, it takes me about 90 seconds to go through this uh, on the physical exam. Uh, and I have a scribe, so I, I put my headlight on, put my gloves on, I touch their face, I feel all those areas, and I go through each of these in a very sequential order, and I would advise, recommend that you do the same so that you don't forget anything. Uh, because initially, it's a pretty daunting thing. I mean, that's a whole face. Well, we'll start it out. We we'll start out at the top and the forehead. I note the height of the forehead, the hairline, the ridges. We're all familiar with vertical thirds, uh, upper third, middle third, lower third, and the aesthetic ideal is to have them approximately uh, proportional. Of course, with aging, with, with time, the uh, proportions change. How, how do they change? You guys know? Something it increases, something decreases, right? And that's change. What increases? Nobody knows. Upper third increases. How does upper third increase? Upper third can enlarge over time. When we're born, we have low, small upper thirds. And as we age, the upper third increases. Now, patients with high upper thirds means they have a high forehead, right? And high forehead typically means what? They're either very intelligent or they're very wise. It also means they're old. <laughs> because you don't gain wisdom through through you, you gain wisdom through experience. So think about it from the standpoint of male pattern baldness. You have the recession of the anterior hairline, you have an infinite upper third, and you're very wise, but also very old. <laughs> What's the significance of that? The significance of that is whatever we do, we don't want to expand the upper third. Um, when we're doing a facial rejuvenation procedure, what might expand the upper third? How about a coronal brow loop where you make an incision and you take out a swatch of hair bearing skin? What does that have to do to the anterior hairline? It expands it. Now, a few select minority of your patients might benefit from that if they have really simian hairlines, you know, a really low hairline. But most of the time, their hairline's are already pretty high, and then you do something that makes them, you may get their brow in better position. This is not talk, talk about brow, I'm just talking about general facial analysis. You don't want to do that. You want to, you want to do things that doesn't affect the hairline. And that's where trichophytic brow lift becomes uh, more useful, endoscopic brow lift is done properly. But in any case, that's just uh, so make the note of the height of the hairline, the position of the hairline, position of the right against the brow, the position, the movement, symmetry. Uh, as a, in my experience, every patient has asymmetric eyebrows. This is a patient who came to see me about 20 years ago, 15 years ago or so, and she thought the brows were getting a little heavier. 
And so I did an endoscopic brow lift for her. I didn't change her hairline. She had a pretty high hairline as it was, and her hairline may be slightly higher. But you'll notice the symmetry of her eyebrows. Her right brow was lower than the left brow, and I always tell patients that I will preserve that because of that asymmetry. I lift things the same amount on the left side and the right side, so her native in, uh, asymmetry is preserved. And the reason for that is because the brow asymmetry reflects not only their, their behavioral habits and facial movement preferences, but also underlying facial skeletal asymmetries. And while I can raise the right eyebrow a little bit to match the left eyebrow, then her orbit would be, which orbital, bony orbital rims, which are at different levels, you can see the right orbital rim is lower than the left, then the distance between the uh, orbital rims and the brow will be different. And that's how people change, they look at the, the mirrors, uh, their faces in the mirror after surgery and say, I don't look like myself. And that's what they're referring to. I mean, you've changed, altered their fundamental symmetry. And so try not to do that. Recognize, it's important to recognize it and point it out to them and then tell them what you're gonna do that you don't alter, them, alter their fundamental um, asymmetry. Upper eyelid, obviously, fullness, skin redundancy, and ptosis of the eyelid. So patient has descent and deflation. Descent happens in the, can happen in the eyebrow, where the brow, in the females at any rate, drop below the superorbital rim. Um, uh, as, as our guideline, typically the lateral uh, arch of the brow should be at or above the bony superorbital rim. Over time, it can descend further down, which can compress the amount of skin between the brow and the eyelashes into a smaller and smaller space, which creates upper lid fullness, which causes patients such as this to come into my office. She'll pinch her skin here and say, Dr. Wong, can't you just cut that out for me? And I say, of course I can. But you know, what you have to recognize is the eyebrow, the, the way to think about this is the eyebrow is the foundation of the eyelid. And so the foundation has sagged. Now this is sort of a inverse. Typically when we think of a foundation, we think of something that's supporting underneath, like a structure, a house or something, and something on top of it. Here, because the brow is here, and the lid, the upper lid moves down and up, down and up in an inverse direction, the brow is the foundation in the opposite sense. And as the foundation has sagged, it's caused the, the fullness. So if I take away this, actual, this amount of skin redundancy without addressing the sagging foundation, it'll actually pull the brow down lower. So it's important to recognize that and tell them those are the cases where the patients, now not everybody needs a brow, but those where the brow is low, and based on the superorbital rim, you want to bring that up. Or It's not so much the brow that may be a misnomer, it's more appropriately termed a brow stabilization procedure. An endoscopic brow lift is excellent to keep the brow where it should be. Not necessarily raise it here, everybody walking around the dazzled look, nobody really wants that. But you want to stabilize it, and then you end up doing a much more conservative upper lid blepharoplasty, and that's something that should be noticed. And then of course, eye upper lid ptosis, meaning you know, the MRD1 uh, is decreased down so that the lid is droopy because of levator disinsertion, most likely due to senile changes, and you don't want to miss that diagnosis and just do a blepharoplasty and still have leave ptosis intact. You want to correct the ptosis as you do your blepharoplasty. And so those are things, again, beyond the scope of this discussion, but those are things I look at and I'm taking time to delve into each of these areas, but again, literally in the office it takes 60 to 90 seconds for me to just go through this and as you do this it becomes very quick. The lower lid, you want to note the lower eyelid position in relation to the iris. Uh, pseudo herniated fat, infraorbital hollowing, skin redundancy, and then don't forget the snap and the distraction. If you get asked that on, on the oral quiz, you have to mention well, how is the snap test, how is the distraction test. The snap test, you pull, pull the lower eyelid away from the globe and you release, it should snap right back. If it's delayed or, or, or uh, relaxed or it doesn't snap right back, or the distraction when you pull the lower lid down and let it uh, retract back up to the eyelid, you should take less than a second. If it doesn't completely do that, that signifies what? Abnormal snap of distraction. Laxity of the lower eyelid, which means that you're at greater risk for post operative, if you did lower lip blepharoplasty, post operative uh, rounding of the lower eyelids or frank atropine. And those are things that we, uh, we really, I'll show you an example of that. By pseudo herniation, I'm talking about these bags, just like that first patient I showed you one of the nose strips. These are bags, they're called pseudo herniation because it's not a true herniation, right? These are lower eyelid, the fat pockets of which there are three, medial, central, and, and lateral, and uh, they're, they're post septal. And so herniation, it's not herniation, a true herniation would be the fat came through the orbital septum. 
This fat does not come through the oviseptum. The oviseptum just says relax. And so what we do is we actually just remove the fat. And so that's why it's called the pseudo herniation of the orbital fat. And so this uh, patient underwent uh, lower leg blepharoplasty to get rid of the, uh, the fat bags, as you can see. But in exchange, I've created what? I've created some infraorbital hollows. These are called tear trough hollows. And this was done about 20 years ago before fat transfer. And I'll show you how we deal with that now. So that would be an unsatisfactory outcome in this day and age. Patients would be coming, actually, patients come in with this and say, Can't you fix me? Because I've got these dark circles here. This is where I'm referring to as rounding, verging on ectropia. There is a, a, five, a muscular sling, that medial canthus, the lateral canthus, that supports the lower eyelid. If we do a transcutaneous lower lid blepharoplasty and remove some of the anterior lamella, skin and muscle, and then leave a shortage of the anterior lamella, the scar contraction forces will pull the eyelid down to create this so-called rounding. And if it pulls the conjunctiva away from the globe so it's no longer in contact, that's an atrophy. These are things we want to avoid by diagnosing with a snap in the distraction phase. Got that? Always mention that when, when you're asked about the value of the face and the eyelids. All right, for the cheeks, uh, the position, the fullness, and what tends to happen is deflation. We, we, get the, we get loss of fullness and some descent, and I'll touch on that a little bit more, but our understanding of what happens in this area has increased and progressed by leaps and bounds. It's not just the tissue sags down and we yank it up, which is what we used to do, uh, but that it has sagged down. We move it up a little bit, and we also have to fill it, and so uh, that's been the fundamental change. Here is a relatively young patient who comes, uh, she doesn't look very happy, I'm sort of noticing here. She doesn't look very happy preoperatively, and maybe slightly happier postoperatively. But what I did for her was a buccal cerclage face and neck loop, and I'll talk about what that is, and some fat transfer, and one year postop. And you can see the difference is that the lower eyelid is shorter. As we age, the male of fat type descends, and the lower eyelid increases in length, and as we restore that, fullness to the mid-cheek area, the lower eyelid here is longer, and this is droopier, and this brings it up and improves the contour and shape, makes the sadness of the lower eyelids look better. Uh, and that's uh, the correction that we're trying to achieve that creates a more natural result, not a pulled or overstuffed or overfilled result. The perioral status, some patients will notice, many patients will notice this, especially women, especially when they wear lipstick, they'll say, I'm wearing lipstick and it bleeds up the crevices, up the, up the, the wrinkles. And uh, some will say, well, I, I smoke, and others say, I've never smoked. And this is the result of deflation periorally. And so make sure you, you inspect that area, document that area, you can see the etched lines. This is a past <coughs> smoker who wanted her etched lines to be erased. And one of the best, well, there are a number of things you can do about that, but the, one of the, the best ways to do this is deep laser resurfacing. You can also do this with chemical peel. This is about three, four months after the laser resurgence. So you can see the residual, res with no makeup, the residual pinkness, which fades by about six months. And it just, it basically, it's like taking a virtual eraser and erasing the, the creases and it just gets rid of them. It does come back over time, so you can prevent it if we put a drop of Botox in there every so often. But with mobility and movement, the, the, cre the patients rebuild these creases, which is <coughs> how it's uh, developed in the first place. Occlusion, chin projection, as it relates to chin projection, I always ask patients to show me their teeth and their occlusion because you're familiar with the uh, angles of class of one, two, threes. And if there is a real, a real severe class two, you may want to consider doing something, maybe a chin implant or a sliding genioplasty beyond the uh, topic of our discussion today. But that's something you need to make a note of. And the class two also accentuates jaw formation. So it's not just a matter of improving uh, profile appearance or portion, but also the improvement in the, in the uh, tightness of the, sort of the jawline. And then of course it assesses the submental area, the jaw formation, skin laxity, submental fullness, platysmal banding, and the position of the hyoid and submandibular sub gland positioning. This has been uh, sort of uh, catalog cataloged into different classes and they can be somewhat helpful. It's important to know where there's a low anterior hyoid and notice it's important to know that in advance as a surgeon, and also notice, uh, inform the patient about that because anatomically there's not much we can do to alter the position of the thyroid, and so they'll not never have that really tight 90 degree uh, 
of angle in the neck, if that's what they're looking for, because their basic anatomy doesn't allow for that. And that's something you need to point out to the patients in advance. This is a patient with a, hold the patient with a relatively heavy neck um, who had some facelift, and we were able to get things tightened up because she had favorable anatomy. And so those are the things that's important to notice. And then last, but almost like a throwaway, don't forget this, patients can be very appreciative of that, is the earlobe. We talked about the fact that it increases over time. And let me show you. You can see that it does tend to elongate slightly. And the way to deal with this is very simple. It's a double triangle technique where you cut out one triangle. Uh, the common tendency is to just cut it out along the earlobe. But then you have to stitch it, and that leaves hash marks and irregularities. So you want to preserve the natural curvature as much as possible. So try to make the crisp, clean cuts. Cut out a triangle here. You'll notice the lengths are different for triangle A. This is longer than that. And so that difference has to be made up with a different triangle. B, you tuck, tuck, tuck out that extra length, and it closes up nicely. And this is an easy thing. I incorporate this routinely with my facelift if the patients are bothered by this, especially if they wear dangly earrings and so on. But occasionally, this is a male patient who's had a prior facelift done elsewhere who has a complication. What's the name of this? Anybody know? It's called a, you may hear of a pixie ear, or a teacup ear, or a Buddha ear. All of those refers to the fact that the earlobe is stretched out. And why did that happen? Because when the surgeon did the facelift, he did a very tight closure here, and there was relaxation with the elasticity of the lower face to pull the earlobe down, and that's a stigma of facelift surgery. So he underwent a revision facelift, and I snugged up the earlobe a little bit so it's less, less long. He still wanted a you know, reasonable earlobe. And so that's something to keep in mind, and one of the ways to prevent. So these are the things that I always look for when I do patient evaluations. It seems like it's a lengthy amount of stuff, but in actuality it takes a minute or to just to go over all of that, and it's very, very quick. Once I've done that, then it allows me to move forward to the diagnosis. I have a sense of what the patient wants. I have a sense of their medical fitness um, and for surgery and their social support. I've examined them, so I'm, I, I'm able to render a diagnosis from my assessment. It's like piecing the pieces of the puzzle together. I summarize it and organize it in sequence. Uh, from top to bottom to make it easy to talk to the patients. And of course, always keep in mind the patient's concerns and perspectives, and which leads us to the treatment plan, and that is the what we do. So we talk about the why, the patient satisfaction, uh, and the who, the appropriate people, and the treatment plan is what we do. And this is uh, recommendations that I throw out for patients to think about, uh, sensitive to patient concerns and desires, Specific details, I always go over each of them, uh, whether it's a brow, upper lid, lower lid, facelift, fillers, laser, uh, any other treatments, uh, discuss the risks and complications, and, but it's important to put it in perspective. Patients always ask, what are the risks? What, what's the bad, the worst thing that can happen? I mean, all sorts of things can happen, but it's, what's important is to tell them that even though this can happen, such as blindness around blepharoplasty, I always mention that, yes, you can go blind with blepharoplasty on you, and they go, oh my goodness, and then I sort of follow that up with, yes, it's been reported in the medical literature, number one, number two, I've never encountered it in my personal practice, not and I don't intend to, and number three, it's caused by bleeding, and so that stresses the importance of avoiding the blood thinners in advance before surgery, and avoiding physical exertion after surgery, and they go, oh, okay, that's fine. So put it in the perspective. It's like the other analogy is it's like crossing the street. You're asking me what can happen if I cross the street. Well, you can trip on the curb and fall and break your leg, or you can get hit by a car and die. But what do we do? We look both ways. We make sure no car is coming. We watch where we're going and we cross the street every day of our lives. There are risks, but it's minimal. And we take, we take uh, uh, efforts to minimize those risks. So once things are placed in perspective, patients become much more receptive to uh, this discussion. All right, the the, the uh, treatment costs, financial coordinator, very important. I tend to not get into the financial aspects. I do know Russ and Scott does it differently. But I find it very helpful to have a financial coordinator, have them discuss the, the finance aspect of it, the money side of it, and I deal with the medical side of it, the, the surgical side of it. And for patients, find it easy to, to separate the two out. 
Uh, photo document everything, of course. I have them look at the reports and I have a lookbook so they can look at the before and afters. Most patients don't want to look odd, funny, unnatural, not themselves afterwards. They want to look natural, they want to look like themselves, they want to look better. And that's what I assure patients, I tell them that after surgery you'll look better, you'll look different, of course, that's the point of having surgery. If you don't look any different, that's the point. But what will happen is you'll hear lots of compliments. Your friends, your associates, your colleagues, if they didn't know you had anything done, they'll be able to tell something you look different. But they won't be able to put their finger on why you look so good. You're not going to look stretched. You're not going to look like you're on the back of a motorcycle going 100 miles an hour. You're not going to look, look windswept and unable to close your eyes or weird. But you're going to look really good and expect people to notice that you look good, but they can't tell why you look so good. And patients think, oh yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, so giving them pictures of the lookbook helps and reinforce realistic expectations that they're not going to look uh, strange or, or different. Deformed, I guess. They will look different. So here's Barbie. And I was preparing this lecture a while back. And at the time, my daughter was about three or four years old. And she came into the office at home when I was working. And she saw this picture and said, oh, what, what are you doing? Said, Who's that? Said, oh, that's Barbie. And then just for kicks, I asked her, Who's this? And without missing a beat, she said, That's Barbie's mom. <laughs> Three years old. I mean, you don't need to be a trained anatomist to look at the pseudo herniation and the infraorbital teardrop to, to know that. It's just human nature. Everybody recognizes this. And these are the signs of aging. And what we like to do, of course, is to switch the, uh, from the before to the after, in a manner of speaking. And that, that's what we're going to talk about next. And so the treatment, how do we actually go about doing this? The treatment plan is a decision reached jointly between the patient and the surgeon. I offer out what I think the patient may benefit the patient or the patient is a good candidate for. And the patient tells me if that fits what their conceptual um, plan is and fits their pocketbooks, fits their recovery uh, timeline and all that. I try to be as upfront and, and uh, straightforward as possible. So here's another lady, attractive lady, who uh, comes for an aging face consultation, wants her face to look better. Um, brow lift, anybody? The brow looks pretty good. I agree. Uh, upper eyelid? Maybe a little bit. Lower lid? She doesn't have pseudo herniated fat, but she does have some hollowing. Uh, lower face, she has pretty full cheeks, but you can see her lower eyelid is really descending. <coughs> so here's what I did for her. Buckle supplage, face and neck lift, upper lid blepharoplasty, and some fat transfer, and aronoplasty. I mean, it's incidental. She didn't like her crooked nose, so we straightened that out. But uh, I didn't do anything to her eyebrow, but her upper lid was a little full, and she was bothered by it, so treated that. I didn't do anything to her lower eyelids, but her lower eyelid is shorter. You can see her mid-face is fuller. That's from a combination of the buckle supplage and some filling to decrease the length of the lower eyelid to get rid of this expanse that tighten things up. And of course, her nose, I mean, she, she was an attractive lady beforehand and afterwards, she just looks better. Um, you can see her jawline. I didn't get rid of every last jowl, and I tell them that sometimes you can't tighten it up so much that it and then, of course, at one year, you expect a little relaxation. But overall, the neck is much tighter and uh, sort of slender. You'll notice the change in tip rotation that of, uh, occurs with time and slight, subtle upward rotation. Not excessive. Nobody wants Miss Piggy's nose. And you can see that more from the side view. A little uh, rasping down the dorsum to make the nose just a little more proportional, a little smaller. The neck, not. Big change, not huge change. She had a pretty good neck before. Her jowl is a little, little improved from that, and her upper eyelid is a little less crazy <clears throat> skin, I guess. And from the from the other view, you can see. I, I think the fullness of the cheek from the fat transfer, I think, is really helpful in addition to the tightening and shortening of the malar, um, of the lower eyelid and improvement of the malar fat. So the aging face consultation, to me is more important than the actual surgical aspect, of it, which we'll get to next. And the goal is, of course, patient satisfaction. Happy patients is really, really important. Each patient is unique. We have to recognize that. Always keep an open mind for us, for the surgeons. Don't go in with your preconceptions. Ask open-ended questions and, of course, listen to the patient. 
general approach to medical, surgical, social, physical exam. We went through that. Treatment recommendations, discussion, procedures, expectations. Go through all of it in detail. Answer every question many times because patients oftentimes forget. I, I say the same things and I feel like I'm uh, on repeat, which I am. But if I put myself in the patient's position, they retain 20% of what we say, 30% of what we say. So don't uh, be don't be impatient. Be be kind and repeat. Write it down. Repeat. Even if you write it down, they lose it. And then treatment decisions. It's a joint decision. It's not like I'm the surgeon. This is what I'm going to do to you. It doesn't work that way at all. So evolution of facial techniques as the facial structure changes, we're going to reverse that with uh, little procedures. So when I first started out doing facial surgery, I learned the, the most innocuous method, and that's a subcutaneous dissection, subcutaneous flap. Basically elevating this, the skin flap in the subcutaneous plane, overlying everything else. And uh, this is, you can do this uh, with a scalpel or with scissors. I've found over time that scissors is easier to do and faster. And there are two basic forms of subcutaneous flaps. There's a short flap, which means you extend the incision around the ears where this is maybe seven to 10 centimeters around the ear, but you do not connect underneath the submittal area. Or there is the so-called long flap, which goes all the way across so that you can theoretically shake hands underneath here. And this whole thing is lifted up. The long flap may be more advantageous because you're releasing more tissue, but it also has, so it has disadvantages. It takes longer. Um, it's technically harder. You have greater risk for hematoma, uh, and then greater risk of flap viability because you're devascularizing potentially a greater part of the, of the skin flap, whereas, whereas the short flap may have less, uh, less uh, tightening, but it's safer flap, it's shorter, it's easier to do overall. The overall disadvantage of the subcutaneous dissection, whether it's a short flap or a long flap, if that's all you do, is longevity because it doesn't last. If you just tighten the skin, and this is when I first started out, uh, this is six months post-op, you can see tighten the skin only, she got a lot of loose skin, not much fat, and just tighten it up, and it's better, but I would anticipate in two years or so that she would be, well, it's not, not quite that, that relaxed, but she would have lost a lot of the improvement just because of natural skin, loss of elasticity. And so that is, it's something that can work. I mean, we all do parotid surgery and very comfortable with that. You can do a parotid, you can do a facelift. It's, it's much easier than a parotid. You don't have to find the facial nerve. You just stay superficial to it. The problem is, is that the subcutaneous dissection only it doesn't really last. But it's very easy to increase the longevity, and we'll get to that next. This is a, a physician, actually, who uh, had upright with and skin only facing that was one of my early patients uh, from way back, and got a nice improvement. But in order to add longevity to the procedure, we incorporate some manipulation of the SNAS, uh, superficial muscular proneurotic layer or system that was described back in the 70s. And this uh, deeper layer immediately below the subcutaneous. And the SNAS offers greater, it's an extension of the galia above and platysma below. And it offers a, another layer for gripping and tightening the uh, underlying facial structures. One key anatomic uh, relationship to keep in mind is the temporal branch of the facial nerve crosses over the zygoma in the middle third portion of the zygomatic arch and travels in the same plane as the SNAS so that we don't want to make an incision right here because we risk jeopardizing um, the uh, forehead movement. And so there are two ways to manipulate the SNAS in general. There's the plication method, which means the pleat over and fold it over itself. And usually you can use some stitches, which plicates the SNAS so using uh, some, something like a 4-0 PDS suture and tighten it up. And that pulls things up in a very effective way. Or you can do imbrication, which means you make an incision in the SNAS. Now the incision in the SNAS is made one centimeter, one finger breadth below the zygomatic arch. Why is that? Because we want to preserve the uh, temporal branch of the facial nerve as it travels over the zygomatic arch. So you, you don't make it right at the zygomatic arch. I put my finger there, make an incision, come down, and I can elevate, and then I support. The, I can make a little, little uh, tail to support that. It can help with my dissection by hydrodissecting it with, by injecting it with a local. Here's the zygomatic arch. I go one finger breadth below that, parallel the ear incision, and parallel the SCM. Inject hydrodissect, 
and then it's a very bloodless plane. That's this mass. You can split this mass like this, and then put this right at the earlobe, and this posterior tongue goes uh, stitched down to the mastoid fascia, as you can see here. And that gives you a little superior elevation and a little posterior elevation. And uh, that can improve the tightness of the neckline and stitch down in this vector. And you can see that here, this is a lady who's had that. And there's some, some improvement. It doesn't really help with the jowls here as much. And so there's some improvement in the neckline, but the jowls are still a little, a little relaxed. And so from the regular SMAS imbrication, you can extend that to the extended SMAS, which means exactly as the name sounds, extending the smasta section, but here you're getting more into more nervous territory in both senses of work, meaning that you need the nerves and you know, your sphincter tightness. And so here, instead of actual dissection, I'm spreading here to minimize um, nerve damage. And you can spread, the, actually spreading vertically is, uh, is more helpful. But what it does do is it does allow you to traction the the jowls and tighten that up a little bit. This is early result, but it does, it creates a sort of a weird look. It creates an unha uh, unnatural appearance. And it, I did like two or three of these in my practice, and each time it was, it was just intensely stressful for me. And I didn't like the results, so I stopped doing that. And about the same time, Sam Hammer, who's a plastic surgeon in um, Texas, Dallas, Texas, uh, this came up with the deep plane facelift where he described the descent of the malar fat pad and how he was able to describe a method of what called the deep plane dissection involving a platysmal dissection below the mandibular line and a subplatysmal smash dissection above the mandibular line transitioning to the super smass anteriorly and the key, this is the key part of the of the deep plane dissection, and that is the lysis of the zygomatical cutaneous ligaments in the supra smass plane, right here, the so called uh, McGregor's patch, which always bleeds in this area. You have to lyse that. That's where the fibrous attachments from the zygoma to the skin occurs. And he understood that the innervation of the zygomaticus major comes from inferiorly, so if you stay superficial, to the, on the superficial surface of the zygomaticus major muscle, you can actually dissect out that path, and there is a tunnel that you can go right down to the malar fat pad and lift that up, and that's for the so-called deep plane facelift. This was popularized in the mid-90s, and uh, the American Academy has a video library, and I made the very first deep plane facelift video for our academy's video library. I came across it recently, it's an old VHS format, so I sped it up, it runs, it's a, like a 30 minute tape, I sped it up to finish in one minute. So basically that's what a deep plane facelift is. Um, it's uh, something that I used to, there you can see the attachment of the zygomatic cutaneous ligament, and then you lyse it, and then you can pull the whole face up. There, that's it. And it's done in such a way so that you, as you're lysing the zygomatic cutaneous ligaments, you know that the nerve is safe because you're superficial to it. Because those ligaments, when you have it under stretch, they, just look, they look just like nerves. So it's, once you figure, actually, I have to say, I studied this technique, the, the technical dissection, the anatomic uh, layers, and it was when I learned how to do a deep plane dissection, deep plane facelift uh, successfully, that I started to enjoy doing facelift surgery. Prior to this point, doing the, as I said, the extended smash, I didn't like that at all. The, and then just doing the subcutaneous dissection, it was just a bloody mess. And it seemed like a surgical flail to me. But once I learned the deep plane dissection, it became an enjoyable surgical anatomic dissection. And once I learned that, it's, I enjoy facelift surgery. It's one of the, like, that and rhinoplasty are my most favorite procedures, I would have to say. So these is, this is the anatomic dissection, subcutaneous dissection. This is sub-smass of the so-called deep plane. And actually, you transition to super-smass here to lift up the malar fat pad. And it's a very effective technique. This is just deep plane uh, face and neck lift where you can tell as we age, our faces develop more of a square appearance. And the goal is to transition that to a triangular shape with reestablishing the fullness in the cheek area. And this is without that transfer. Just uh, 
supporting the, the Mailer fat pad. And this can be very effective. This is a one-year post-op in a relatively thin patient. You can see the lower lid is long, elongated, and this has been improved in terms of the fullness. And this does last over the short term. Now, one of the more aggressive methods in patients who may not need a neck lift is to do a subperiosteal endoscopic mid-face lift in combination with subperiosteal endoscopic brow lift. And that allows us to tighten the mid-face. Again, she looks a little tired here. Why? Not because of the brow droop, because of the lower lid being longer. And this is improved because the mid-face has been brought up. Many times patients come to me and say, I don't like the way my face is, the direction my face is going. They can't put their finger on why it is. And just before and after, she just looks older here and looks less old there. And all we did was not so much a brow lift, maybe brow stabilization, not even an upper eye lift, just an endoscopic mid-face lift. And bringing up the fullness of the mid-face is something that can refresh and rejuvenate. And decreasing the increased length of the lower lid, making that shorter is helpful. So this is, uh, and this, is, this definitely lasts. It's an endoscopic lift four years post out. You can see the flattening of the malar fat pads and the fullness that's been able to be restored, especially in the oblique view, how this is sort of descended and become hotic and the lower lid becomes longer. Can you see that here? The lower lid is shorter and this is fuller. And that's what the endoscope, that's all we're trying to achieve here. But this is a fairly aggressive, invasive method that, frankly, corrects the tissues into a non-anatomic position. I mean, we subperiosteally undermine the cheek tissues and then surgically lift it up in a place they've never been to before. And so, uh, but it's a very effective technique. This is the patient who's had a previous facelift who came back for endoscopic mid-facelift and revision of deep plane mid-face, or deep plane uh, lower facelift uh, a year after surgery, and it really puffs up. The, this is a combination of moving the malar fat pad superficially and deep, and can really puff up the lower cheek area, or the niche, the malar area, you can see, and diminish the length of the lower eyelid, and shorten that, and fill out the mid-cheek region. This is a, a uh, a TV personality, actually, in Portland, North Pacific Northwest, and she had a previous facelift elsewhere, but feels her face was not looking as youthful as she once was, and I did an endoscopic cheek lift on her, and she loved it, and she couldn't quite verbalize what it was that bothered her, but you can tell, now that once we understand that the lengthening of the lower eyelid occurs in the center of the middle of that, that once we pick that up, that can help improve the positioning of the face, you can see the lower lid is longer, there's a fullness, and then the cheek, and then this becomes very short. And, uh, and then another similar revision type of case where the facelift was done before, and then the mid-cheek lift can be helpful. So this was the Bible back in the mid-90s, early 2000s, composite uh, ritidectomy by Sam Hamra. But then interestingly, in early 2000s, mid-2000s, he came out with this very honest look at his own results, study of the long-term effect of malar fat repositioning in the deep plane facelift surgery, short-term success but long-term failure, which at this time was mimicking my findings, my observations, my own patients. The deep plane facelift took me about three, four hours to perform usually, um, and uh, the results immediately were very good, but uh, over the long term, it didn't seem that much different than the SMATS or plication results that I was uh, obtaining. And then of course, our understanding of facial aging has evolved and progressed, and uh, primarily in that it's not just the descent of tissues, but also the deflation and the loss of normal anatomic subcutaneous facial fat compartments gives off the appearance of increased laxity of descent and the uh, prominence of the nasolabial fold. And so our understanding of the different compartments of the fat and their relationship to each other and to changes over time helped us understand that it's not just the descent, but the, in fact that we actually are losing volume, losing fullness of the face. I was lecturing in uh, Bogota, Colombia recently and uh, went to the uh, Botero Museum. He's the artist famous for drawing fat faces, full faces, right? And so here's one of his subjects with the typical full face. And then, still with a kind of a full face, but look at the descent and the deflation, which highlights the boniness and skeletonization of the face. I mean, very observationally accurate, uh, but definitely 
an older representation, which explains why the billion dollar market for facial fillers has evolved in terms of filling. Uh, but then, you know, just like lifting alone isn't the answer, filling alone isn't the answer either. And so that our evolving concept of the aging process is not only the center segment, but also loss of tissue volume. And traditional surgical rejuvenation was focused on lifting the deep point phase of the lip and then the subcutaneous face of the, the uh, subperiosteal facelift, ever more aggressive facelift. But that alone creates less and more unnatural results. And so the current concept is that lifting alone is not the answer. More natural results may be obtained with some re-inflation or tissue augmentation, in addition to perhaps a less aggressive facelift. And this is a picture derived off of the internet. Some person took a, a split image of her own face and then a combo of her mother and grandmother to show some of the effects of the aging process that she can expect. You can see elongation of the lower eyelid, descent of the malar fat and jowl formation and so on. Here's a real live mother-daughter uh, duo that came to my office and the daughter came for some rhinoplastic consultation and the mother came, not with her but at a separate time, and uh, wanted aging face surgery. Of course I couldn't take my eyes off of the mother's nose. She had a rhinoplastic done 30 years ago and was told that nothing could be done about her nostril. But she didn't come for her nose. She came for it. Open-ended questions like I was supposed to, and she said, "You know, my eyes bother me, and I'm looking older." And you can see by looking at her, the mother-daughter, that there's certain facial similarities. Look at the brow; they seem that the right brow is lower here, left brow is higher, and the eye shape is similar. But see how this is elongated and descended, and the fullness is just absent, and some some relaxation down in the lower facial area. So we went ahead and offered her some rejuvenation. Uh, I did actually end up fixing her nose. I sort of talked her into it. And she was very happy about that. <laughs> I was very happy about that. It was hard for me to look at her picture. <laughs> My eyes just went right to the nostril. But anyway, um, we did uh, some brow stabilization and lower face or mid cheek filling so that now you can see better resemblance of the mid facial areas and reestablishment of the facial structures as you might expect. So my current technique, which is applicable in patients with relatively thin neck, mild to moderate skin and muscle laxity, is to do limited submental lap section, a short flap subcutaneous dissection, a buccal cerclage, mass placation is something I described, and I'll call this fat volume augmentation of the inforbital, malar, and periorbital regions. The incisions are made, and the amount of the dissection is about nine centimeters, and the undermining is carried out, and then I, this is the buccal cerclage, I draw a line between the earlobe and the commissure and the, put in some stitches. It's based, it's banked on the Loray's fascia, which is here, which is stabilized and secured to the zygoma and brings all of this up. It doesn't bring the tissues down. And once I do this, then I suspend this mass posteriorly to the mastoid and anteriorly to the deep temporal fascia. And this is a very short video of how I actually do this procedure. We make the uh, infratemporal incision so I don't really affect the temporal tuft. I make this uh, at the uh, apex of the tragus, so I call this an apical tragal incision. Most people co commonly refer to this as a retro tragal incision, which is actually not correct. It's not behind the tragus, it's right on the apex of the crest of the tragus. I find this little horizontal incision to be really helpful to preserve the lobe attachment and keep it, uh, keep it natural looking, so that that little horizontal extension there. And then behind the ear, you'll notice I'm slightly, with the ear reflected, I'm about half a centimeter above the sulcus because once I release the ear, it falls right down in the sulcus. And then oftentimes I have to do a little release in the posterior uh, occipital hairline, which I move in an irregularly irregular fashion. I remove the skin of the uh, overlying the tragus from the anterior to posterior direction to preserve the tragal cartilage because the tragal cartilage is always riding a little bit higher in the skin incision. If I go from posterior to anterior, I oftentimes nick the cartilage and damage it. I use small scissors to undermine. You can see the extent of the undermining. Subcutaneous undermining, very easy. The big facelift scissors surgeons have devised. I find the small scissors gives me greater tactile formation and information, and it's about nine centimeters. And when I go to the edge of the small scissors, that's the extent of my dissection. Here's a SMAS. I'm using two zero vicro uh, plication sutures, and I'm basically getting, taking those six bites for the buccal cerclage suture, which allows me to compress everything, uh, sort of like a purse string, 
effect, but the, uh, the lifting effect comes superiorly as opposed to going down inferiorly because of the resi resilience and the stability of the low-raise fascia. Once this is tightened up, then we perform what's called a vertical vector lift. The skin is lifted up, we trim away the excess, uh, and uh, close everything up with uh, dissolvable stitches. Every, all the stitches I use are dissolvable. I don't, I've moved away from permanent sutures because I've used that in the past. So you go back in on these patients, uh, and the st stitches are just sitting there under no tension whatsoever. And of course, that's body's natural tendency to get rid of tension, to get rid of any stress. And so it doesn't really uh, serve any useful purpose. And of course, I've had issues with permanent sutures sticking out and causing permanent problems, so I've just moved away from that. You can notice this is a vertical vector, not a posterior vector. That creates a windswept look, which I avoid that. And that tends to be more of a, of a tendency in the past, of stretching, pulling the face back, and that's what gives people the face look, the face lift look, which we, we minimize. And then we trim things away and, and repair everything. So here's a patient who had the buccal supplage face and neck lift and endoscopic brow. One year post up, you can tell by her little nevus here how that's been shifted. It's mostly vertical vector, you can see that. Mostly vertical vector, fairly significant lift. It does work pretty well. And then we've augmented fat transfer, first described in the late 1800s. Multiple methods because of the variable outcomes, but structural fat grafting popularized by Sid Coleman in the 90s uh, with developed instruments and techniques that uh, yielded more predictable outcomes. My preferred site is abdomen because of the quality of fat, but in those cases, the patients are excessively slender, doesn't have fat, we can go to medial thigh or lateral thigh, uh, but though that tends to be a little more fibrous, so it's a little less um, uh, pre preferred, especially in areas such as the invulnerable area where the skin is very, very thin. We use a little fat harvest cannula, and just a syringe technique, which is very simple. When I first started doing liposuction, when it was first introduced, we hooked it up with suction devices and very noisy machines, and now with this, it's super easy. Uh, Tulip makes it, a number of other surgical companies make this. This is through the inferior umbil umbilicus. The foot is to the left, the head is to the right, so we do multiple passes, and then we rinse it out and just wash away. Either you can centrifuge or spin it. That's just an additional piece of machinery that I didn't need. So the key piece here is this uh, tea strainer from William Sonoma that works really well. <laughs> <laughs> you do have to sterilize it, but, the, but it works super well. And then we rinse it off with the saline and uh, transfer it into the injection uh, syringe. And one cc injection syringes with 0.9 uh, cc, 0.9 ml cannulas. And this allows us to very precisely transfer the fat. There's the transfer from the big syringe to the little syringe. And then we try to distribute it. You don't want to just inject the fat in one big lump. You want to sort of marble it into the tissue on the subcutaneous, muscular, superperioxial tissue so that it creates a uniform augmentation. And the areas where I tend to augment are the uh, Inforbital, malar, nasolabial, and the commentary group and the lip, lip areas. So the way I do this is through little punctures. You don't need to make little incisions. Little puncture. You can see the inforbital hollowing right here. That is uh, present after lower lip blepharoplasty. Like the first patient I showed that uh, underwent the lower lip blepharoplasty that resulted in a hollow. Nowadays we would do that, take out the fat, and then transfer fat in a different position. Um, to try to fill out the hollows and diminish the tear troughs. And once this is done, you can see that the, it improves the inferior hollowing and it makes it smoother. So it's not just fat in the lower lid. It has to be fat in the lower lid in the correct place. You can see it's less full, and the other side is still, still depressed. And so this is a, a lady who just had lower lid blepharoplasty and lower lid fat transfer. And you can see the improvement in the aging process of longer lower lid and shorter lower lid, just from the lower lid blepharoplasty, to smooth out the contour and make the transition less abrupt and smoother. And of course, we have the patients who look up to accentuate the pseudo herniated fat before and after. This is an unfortunate young lady who had the facelift done elsewhere, very aggressive facelift who uh, the surgeon unfortunately got some parotid gland, developed a stiff fistula, which took about six months to clear up, which it does. But in the process, the saliva dissolved her facial fat, 
and she has a, a gouge or depression on her face. She became a recluse, became severely depressed, wore her hair long, and refused to leave the house. She came and saw me, and uh, we performed a fat transfer from her abdomen, 25 cc's, and a one year post-op, it does persist. We tell the patients that they do go away. The longevity of fat transfer is typically two to three years, and then it has to be repeated, because deflation is a process that's inexorable and continues. So here she is, improved. Another, uh, this is a 3D view of endobrow, upper and lower with blepharoplasty with fat transfer. The key areas are the shortening of the lower eyelid. You see how long the lower eyelid is and how descended the malar fat is, and how with the lower the blepharoplasty and fat transfer, and then especially with the they look up. You can see the fullness and the improvement of the uh, column in there. Just some representative uh, case samples. Three months post-op, the improvement of the malar region with fat transfer, improvement of the jawline and the neck, of course, and that's obtained from the buccal surplage face and neck, with which you just saw. Another patient, the three months post-op, with nice improvement and malar fat and decreasing the length of the lower eyelid. A younger patient, she looked very good before. Here she's uh, being uh, gummed up for, anesthetized for Botox, that's why her face is shiny. But uh, she's a year post-op. You can see the fullness of the face and the lower lid just looks better. And uh, this is true in men. We, I don't, po I take these pictures, I don't pose them. I just have them look at the camera and take a picture. Usually afterwards they look happier for some reason, which is always a good thing. Um, uh, buccal supplies, uh, upper lids, lipoplasty, and some fat transfer. I think the fat transfer, you can really see the, the hollow in the teardrop here, and that's really diminished from the fat transfer, and that helps. Helps improve, of course, improves the jawline and the neckline. Another similar patient uh, with improvement in the malar fat. This is a revision um, face and neck lift with uh, fat transfer. Again, over time, this just descends and pulls down, and the buckle supply gets this back up, and a little fat transfer goes a long ways. Another similar patient with a heavier neck, as you can see. A more recent patient, the, again, unposed, but she just couldn't stop smiling. Sort of a dramatic uh, patient, uh, recent after everything, including resurfacing. You can see the pinkness, she has no makeup on. But the transition of the lower eyelid and the improvement of the lower eyelid, how long it is here and how that's going to be faced with some little <coughs> powder foundation, she really looks very, very good. And you can see all the wrinkles are, are removed. Similar patient who also had a rhinoplasty. Her nose was a little crooked, straighten that out. An older patient, one year post off the lower lip lephoplasty, very effective, very safe technique. It works, it works very, very well. Um, and so this is what I'm doing now. This type of surgery takes me, this is a patient I showed the fat transfer on. Uh, this procedure takes me about two hours to do from top to bottom, uh, beginning to end. So it's half the time of, uh, of the, uh, of the deep clean face lift. And with a fat transfer, it's very safe. Patient's recovery is much shorter. Patients are very happy. We've written about fat transfer uh, with uh, Christian Stallworth, one of our other fellows. I think Christian was actually a year before uh, Scott Steffen. So that's, oh yes. So, so that's Scott Steffen, speaking of Scott Steffen. This is him in Peru. We were at, not the Machu Picchu ruins, but one of the other ruins that's a Kizak. We had to hike up like 2,000 feet to get up here. And uh, some of the other team members that we went with, the, those uh, these ruins, these Incan ruins, are really pretty remarkable how, uh, how it's sort of put together without any mortar. And of course, the rite of passage is um, there is a delicacy in Peru where they eat the guinea pigs called kui, and every fellow has to eat kui. And Scott knew that. I mean, it's not for science. But, uh, but he chose to go, and he was enjoying his kui meal. You know that day, and then he, of course, has endeared himself to the local nursing staff. Uh, <laughs> but not to be outdone, here's uh, Russ and the lovely wife Susie, myself, and some of the other colleagues, and sitting down to a nice meal, in, uh, also in South America, in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, basically. So that completes my talk. I
right before noon. So uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'd like to invite you to visit us in Portland. Here's an excuse, if you want one. I'm putting on the Aging Face course this coming August. Uh, email me, and uh, we'd love to get you out there to the Pacific Northwest. Thanks much, very much for having me. It's my pleasure.